May 1940. The world watches hopelessly as Nazi invaders mount a blitzkrieg attack against France and march triumphantly through the streets of Paris. But behind the tears of a defeated people comes the rumbling of rebellion. Enraged French citizens answer General de Gaulle's command and fight for freedom with an underground organization committed to sabotage and other acts of defiance. This resistance grew bit by bit, comprised of both men and women, regardless of political, moral or religious persuasion. I became a founder of the Parisian Liberation Committee and the organization that directed the resistance and the national insurrection. Hitler himself visited France during the occupation. He marveled at the great monuments. He reveled in his conquest. Even the Eiffel Tower, 51 years old and over a thousand feet tall, became a hostage as Germans exploited its great height, using the tower as an antenna to send coded radio signals to their armies. Ironically, the silhouette of the tower against the Paris skyline offered hope to the free French underground. It was a symbol of liberty, a symbol of France. Under the occupation, the idea predominated among all the French to know that one day one would be free to climb up the Eiffel Tower. When Allied troops finally liberated Paris, this handful of free Frenchmen celebrated by climbing the Eiffel Tower and unfurling the French tricolor flag. Down below, citizens spat and cursed at the fleeing Germans. But from the pinnacle of the tower, liberty, equality, and fraternity reclaimed its mantle of glory. For most of the world, the Eiffel Tower is France. It is light and hope, poetry and magic. Her complex geometry holds the dreams of lovers. The French may enjoy the distinct honor of having created and nurtured this international monument, but her home is in the hearts of free people everywhere. Tonight on Modern Marvels, La Tour Eiffel, the Eiffel Tower. There is something about great height that suggests a spirit of triumph to the soul. It forces people's vision to heaven, while it offers a calming perspective to the chaos of the world below. Throughout the ages, people have challenged architectural and engineering limits to achieve great structural height. Sometimes to spy on enemies approaching from a distance and at other times in an attempt to get closer to God. There are those who insist on finding practical applications for towers. They make good broadcast antennas, or they're a fine place for a revolving restaurant. But the real appeal of towers comes from a purer notion. Towers are a celebration of will. They speak to our ambitions, they are the joyous declaration that we exist. The world's best loved tower is the Eiffel Tower in Paris. Its soaring height, its delicate lines, its airy volume, all reflect the best part of the French spirit. Designed and built in 1889, it was the centerpiece in a celebration of the bloody French Revolution 100 years earlier. On July 14, 1789, in a flood of revolutionary passion, Parisian artisans led an attack against French aristocracy and stormed the Bastille, 
the infamous prison where the poor and politically incorrect were locked away. The insurrection spread across France, and patriots rallied to the battle cry of freedom, the Marseillaise. Let us go, children of the fatherland. Our day of glory has arrived. Against us stands tyranny. The bloody flag is raised. Come together in the countryside to lower these savage soldiers. They come right into our arms to cut the throats of your sons, your country. To arm, citizens, form your battalions, let us march, that their impure blood should water our fields. This nationalistic eruption reverberated across Europe and set the stage for modern democratic movements. And the French people were justifiably proud of the positive contributions their revolution had made. But a century later, the French ego was bruised after a devastating military defeat to Germany. The idea of mounting a spectacular international exposition seemed like a grand way to remember past glory and forget about contemporary setbacks. They were still um, sad because there was, there was in 1870 a terrible war with Germany and we had lost uh, two provinces, Alsace and Lorraine. And so for that, the French people were very pleased to have this exhibition to show they, they were very great and, uh, you see. Um, the country was quite rich. It was decided there needed to be a centerpiece for the celebration, an artistic statement which would loom over the crowds. The bravado of the industrial age suggested an engineering accomplishment, a tower. The tower was important um, as uh, something very clever in technology, you see. And nobody in the world was able to build a tower of uh, a thousand feet, you see. Um, lots of people tried in America. Uh, there were lots of plans of towers, but they never built them. A competition was held for design. Architects from all over France submitted elaborate plans. The first one was um, done by a man called Maurice Coquelin. He was one of the first engineers in Gustave Eiffel's uh, staff. Gustave Eiffel was France's premier architect engineer. His reputation sprang from his visionary work on bridges. He explored the revolutionary concept of metal frame construction. His genius attracted the finest architects in France to his studio and Eiffel's association with the project virtually guaranteed its funding and completion. Two young engineers on Eiffel's staff, Maurice Coquelin and Emile Nogier, actually created the concept of the 300-meter tower for the 1890 exhibition in Paris. They sketched the first crude designs for a framed structure, then called on architect Stephen Savastra to add ornamental flourishes, the arching floral elements and sculptural nuances. Their romantic inspiration was an 1887 French architectural notion that one could touch the sky from a structure if it reached the impossible height of 1,000 feet. Eiffel saw their plans and shared their dream. Their work was soon adopted by Monsieur Eiffel. At first, he agreed to add his name to the contest submission to improve its chances of winning. But he quickly became interested in the tower concept and began to add his own unique flourishes. Once Eiffel's name was on the project, everyone knew the outcome of the competition. With his social and political connections, Eiffel was well equipped to push the project through the Parisian bureaucracy. And he had the technical ability to transform the project from a paper design to a three-dimensional reality. The tower was designed to represent France's participation in the industrial age. As a symbol and as an engineering challenge, there was a lot riding on the success of the tower. But Eiffel was determined to exhibit the same innovative spirit in construction that he had employed in the design.
It is air and light, form and motion, as sturdy as man's resolve and as ethereal as his thoughts. The Eiffel Tower is as much an idea of structure as it is an extraordinary physical monument. And the process of its construction reflects both the concept of prefabrication from the industrial age and the advanced building theories of the dawning 20th century. February 28, 1887. Gustave Eiffel gathered a crowd of dignitaries to witness the commencement of construction. He was 53, and this tower was to be his crowning achievement. As the ceremonies proceeded, 50 engineers were still drafting over 5,300 detailed blueprints for the 132 workmen at the site. It would take four months to lay the foundation for the legs. Two pillars were set on six and a half foot thick concrete slabs set 23 feet below ground. The remaining two legs were positioned so close to the Seine River that watertight metal dams had to be lowered into the damp earth so the concrete could set beneath the seeping water line. The square encompassed by the four legs was 426 feet on each side, broad enough to distribute evenly the structure's 7,000 tons of iron. Onto these foundations arose masonry bases embedded with two anchoring bolts for each of the four feet. From here, the legs would rise at a sharp 60-degree angle as hollow framework beams. The beams were made of angle brackets and flat bars riveted together with stiffeners attached to the sides. Four of these assemblies combined to form the entire beam. The beam had the same structural dynamic as a series of interlocking cubes. And this is the genius of Eiffel's design. The framework support is as sturdy as solid stone at only a fraction of the weight. It was also easily erected with standardized, inexpensive, prefabricated materials. Eventually, 18,000 metal parts and 2,500,000 rivets would comprise the tower. Yet all of the pieces are either flat bars, angle brackets, or plates. The first stage of the construction was also the most critical. All four legs needed to rise simultaneously and meet on an exact horizontal plane at the tower's first floor. The reticle angle demanded scaffolding support for each of the legs and a center scaffold to support the center ring girder which held the structure together. 800-ton thrust jacks operated by manual hydraulic pumps installed under each leg helped to raise and lower the four sides independently in order to reach the required precision. When this was achieved, Gustave Eiffel knew there was nothing that could stop the completion of his dream, although there were those who would try. Eiffel was annoyed by people who lived near the tower who said that it would fall on their houses, and nobody would cover the, the risk. He covered it by himself. Likewise, many people feared that the tower would destroy the Paris skyline. When it was started to be constructed, uh, some people tried to stop it, you see. And uh, some painters, uh, writers, architects wrote a letter saying it's, it's a scandal. The Paris arts community saw the tower as a rude industrial imposition on the city's beauty. Dozens of French writers and painters attacked the tower in a public declaration. I feel Paris is threatened, claimed one artist, by this positively tragic lampstand issuing from her stomach. Eiffel responded with equal passion. The tower will be the highest building ever raised by man, he exclaimed. Will it not have a majesty of its own? By April 1st, 1888, the 300 meter Tower of Paris was an eruption of iron lifting skyward and carrying with it the spirit of France. And finally, the general public, it seemed, was falling in love.
the people in Paris, general public, uh, really felt a very strong uh, feeling of admiration toward this tower. What had begun as the skeletal suggestion of form was now exhibiting grand flowing design. The graceful rise of the legs, the arcing decorative additions contrasting with the stern regimen of exposed bolts. Here was a work of art that spoke to an aggressive world preparing for dramatic change. The work progressed with lightning speed. Eiffel was mounting the operation as if he were conducting a war with crisp military precision. The structure was in fact prefabricated in the Eiffel uh, factory. While the tower was assembled, at the most you had something like 300 people working on the site. Bits of the structure littered the site like scattered pieces of a child's erector set. Riveting teams worked in groups of four to keep up with the frantic pace. As soon as one load of iron was attached, four 12-ton cranes would deliver more, crawling up the guide shafts where future elevators would soar. The second floor was finished a little over a year after the start of construction. And less than a year after that, on March 31st, 1889, the entire tower was complete. It had taken only two years, two months, and five days to build what would be the world's tallest structure for the next 40 years. Remarkably, there was not a single death as the result of the challenging and dangerous work. Eiffel himself was the first to climb the 1,710 steps to the summit and unfurl the French tricolor flag. Beneath him, the city of Paris. It seemed as if its soul was being funneled up the mighty legs of the tower and sprayed across the sky in a celestial celebration. When the 1889 Universal Exposition of Paris was officially opened, the glittering centerpiece was the 300-meter tower. Officials called it the greatest crowd flabbergasting machine ever built. But soon it was simply to be known as the Eiffel Tower. The tower was called at first the Tower of 320 Meters. Even in the beginning, the pylon of 320 meters, then the 320 meter tower. I don't know exactly when it became the Tower of Mr. Eiffel and later the Eiffel Tower. I think it escaped him that it would go.